Welcome everyone to the second meeting of the Launch Book Club. We are here to discuss part one of Escaping the Housing Trap. I wanted to include Dan's economic summary uh, based on Dan's presentation at the last meeting. Uh, he brings a very interesting economic perspective to this. So in Escaping the Housing Trap, uh, Dan, so Dan's economic summary is that in Escaping the Housing Trap, the economic analysis highlights the transformation of housing from mere shelter to a significant investment. It explores the evolution of mortgage structures, detailing how these are monetized and packaged alongside the shifting financial and profit incentives. This progression has driven up housing prices, making homes increasingly unaffordable for many. The book encourages readers to understand these mechanisms as pivotal factors in the housing affordability crisis. Um, so wanted to very quickly do an overview of part one to just articulate a couple of the big themes that we found in part one and then we'll get to the discussion part of this. So big idea number one is there is a tension between housing being an investment and housing being a shelter. People do need shelter, right? And I think that um, I found the introduction of the book especially powerful, talking about the ways in which people who have suboptimal housing choices available to them might be trapped in a bad housing situation, even if it might look like they're in a really good housing situation. Um, and I thought the examples of people who, you know, might be living in their parents' basement because they can't afford a place in the community, or someone who might be a victim of domestic abuse but can't afford to leave their home, I, I thought that those examples were really powerful. Because most people can't afford to pay cash to buy a home, um, we allow people to buy homes using debt or to borrow someone else's money or, or to borrow someone else's home in exchange for paying rent. But it costs money for that home to be built. Uh, lumber, labor, land, and that money has to show up right away, right? It has to show up all at once in order for that home to be built. And this is, that, that tension between the fact that you can't, most people can't afford a home right away, up front, all at once, and the need for those people to be able to pay for it over time, whether they're paying a mortgage or paying rent, that is the root of the financialization of housing. That is what creates the mortgage, it's what creates debt structures, and it what's, it's what creates the need to package and repackage those mortgages like we discussed last time. The people who provide that money that shows up all up front, those are the investors, right? Those are the people who, in exchange for getting, who put up all the money up front in exchange for getting paid more money later in the end, and we call that interest. I think it is worth it for us to ask all of ourselves a hard question, which is, are we seeking shelter as people or are we investors? Um, by a show of hands, if actually, everyone close their eyes for a second. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone here who needs shelter who doesn't have it? Raise your hand, I'm just curious. Okay, so, there's, so everyone here has shelter. And so we've all had that need fulfilled for us. But I would then ask you a question, are you an investor? And so for example, um, do you have kids in a school in town, right? that makes you an investor in housing because your kid's education relies on property taxes. You can open your eyes, by the way, sorry. <laughs> um, if you have a bank account, that bank account probably gets issued to someone else as a mortgage and the bank only holds a fraction of your money in case you need it. Um, if you have a retirement plan, if you're not retired yet, but if you have a retirement plan, whether that's a 401k or a pension, you are an investor because that money winds up rolling into the housing market because of the way that the government has securitized and made less risky investments in housing. You know, if you, if you plan to use your home to fund your retirement, if you plan to withdraw equity, right, you have a vested interest in the price of housing going up because that means that you can better fund your retirement. Or, frankly, if you own a home right now, but you might sell it to go somewhere else. Right, either for a job or to get closer to your kids or your grandkids, that also makes you an investor in housing. And so while um, we all want housing as shelter, I think that there's a compelling case that we're all also in many ways vested in the idea of housing as an investment. Big idea number two, the way that we have designed and built cities has changed. Uh, I pulled this figure out of the book that shows the, on the y-axis the value of land and on the x-axis, the distance of that land from the center of a city. And in the traditional development pattern, 
The center of the city is super valuable because it's close to everything. Now, maybe when that city is first founded, it might not be particularly valuable because it's a postage stamp of a city in the middle of nowhere. But people add on to the edge of the city, and then they add on, add on to the edge of the city. And then at some point, maybe someone starts a general store, and they're running a general store out of a lean-to. Well, if the general store is profitable, they might want to build a better building for their store. And that is the incremental process that results in the increasing value of the center of the city and those areas that are centers of commercial and residential and uh, communal activity. And then the city grows out from there. You can actually see this in how Longmont is built, and I think that this is super interesting. Uh, I'm going to show you some maps that come straight from the Longmont Museum. So you can see a little brown spot in the middle of this. this is, these are the boundaries of the city of Longmont in 1950 when the population was 8,000, according to the US Census Bureau. This is the boundaries of the city of Longmont in 1982 when the population was 42,000. It's about 10 times the size that it was in 1950. But the population, you'll notice, hasn't increased by 10x. Part of what changed between 1950 and 1982 is that the mode of development of cities has changed. We no longer use the traditional development pattern in this transition period, and much more are designing our cities to be reliant on cars for infrastructure. And what that means is that it's much more feasible for things to be spaced further apart, but it also just means that it takes up more land, and things wind up being further away. And more of your land winds up being dedicated to the storage of cars and the transportation of cars, which means big wide roads, big parking lots, and less efficient use of that land. In comparison, you can see the city of Longmont in 2024. So everything that's colored in here is the Longmont planning area. These are the, the zoned parts of the city of Longmont. And that map is actually the city's zoning map. And you can see that actually the city's land area has about doubled again between 1982 and 2024. And at here in 2024, the city's boundaries are basically going to stop growing due to, the city's, due to the city and the county's open space policies. And so this is the land that we've got. I pulled some pictures out of the museum as well to show the difference, not just sort of at the map level, but also at the human level, what these different modes of development feel like. This is a picture of downtown Longmont from about 1910. Distances basically have to make sense across the entire city for you to walk or to, to ride a horse there. And as a result of that, people tended to live close to the things that they need. On the other hand, in, once you get to 1982 and urban development, so this is a picture of uh, the parking lot of the Ace Hardware that's north on Main or on 17th. There's actually, despite the amount of asphalt that you see in this picture, not a street in this picture. Uh, this park, this throughway is actually wider than Main Street was in 1910, and it's just there for the passage of cars for people going to the Ace Hardware or to the other stores that are in that shopping plaza. And it's because distances are less meaningful when you can take a car places, because you get to sit down and just show up in a place after you drive there. People are assumed to live far away from the things that they need, and as a result, there's a heightened emphasis in how we design our cities on vehicle storage and the transportation of people from place to place in single occupancy vehicles. Big idea number three from the book. The forces that financialized housing were well-intentioned. I wanted to pull this quote out of the Longmont Comprehensive Plan from 1987, which, for the record, is the year that I was born. Uh, and because so in, in this in this section of the book, there's a, a statement that's made several times, which is that people would denigrate the quality of starter homes, and they would say, well, we need to make housing better, right? And people were well intentionally trying to improve the quality of housing, but not necessarily thinking about the long term ramifications of that. And when I read that, I thought, yeah, okay, like people hypothetically complained about the quality of starter homes or whatever, but I don't, I, don't, I didn't really believe. Here's a quote from the Longmont 1987 Comprehensive Plan. Concerns have also been expressed about the type and over quality of residential development in Longmont. Much of the residential growth has been lower cost, single family, detached homes on small lots, quote unquote, starter homes. There is concern that housing needs are not being met and that even starter homes should have higher quality standards. And this just, I, I, I got knocked on my ass by this. I thought that this was an amazing thing to read. I also wanted to pull out the graph of the Case-Shiller Price Index from the book. The last one 
really shows the change in the price index over time. And just a quick reminder that this price index tries to uh, sort of average out changes in the cost of housing for inflation and other things like that. And so 100 is, in general on this graph, uh, things staying constant if they if things were 100 taking into account inflation and price changes and income changes and all that other stuff and you can see that we are way way far away from normal historical averages and the problems that we faced as people throughout time in this changed over time as well in the 1920s there were not enough homes and so they built an unbelievable amount of homes and this is the sort of historical section of the book in the 1930s in the great depression oh shoot, people are losing their homes, we need, to do, we need to financially intervene again. In the 1950s, we need a place to put all of our economic output after World War II is over. Let's build more homes. In the 1980s, we can't let savings and loans fail. Let's put more money into the system. In 2008, we can't let the banks fail. Let's put more money into the system. In 2020, during COVID, we can't let people lose their homes. We gotta put more money into the system. And here we sit in 2024, and most people cannot afford a home. I would kind of like a low quality starter home on a small lot. I don't know about anybody else. So really quickly, I wanna prime you for part two of the book and then we will end the meeting. So part two is about something that came up in our group discussion, which is that we felt like part one was very focused on the financial end of this and the, the, the banker perspective of this, but we really felt like the perspective of people who just wanna live in a place was missing. Part two is where you're gonna get that perspective. So there are a couple of topics. Um, the first one is zoning and what it does to cities. Um, I've included here the city of Longmont zoning map for your interest. Uh, if, you, if you're into this sort of thing, you can find it on the city website. It is super duper interesting. Every single parcel of land in the city is represented on this map in intimate detail. You should zoom in and look at your neighborhood. It's super interesting. The next section is about not in my backyard or NIMBY. And it's about the power of no and why, and where the NIMBY movement and perspective comes from, and the influence that it has, and why it has that influence. The next chapter is about the backlash to the NIMBY movement, the yes in my backyard, the power of yes and why not, which is to say the power of a group of people who are trying to say yes to everything and why that may not be the right strategy to solve the problem. And then there's a section on affordable housing, and this is affordable with a capital A, which is to say government subsidized. And it's a section about the actions that the government can take in order to directly subsidize housing for people who need it and some of the limitations of that and why that might not be a solution all on its own either. Our next meeting is on June 17th at 6.30 p.m. here at Longmont Public Media. But by that meeting, we're asking you to read through part two of the book, which is Housing as Shelter, page 147. If you aren't already signed up for the book club mailing list, please sign up for the book club mailing list. You're getting weekly emails with cool information that's related to the section that you're reading. Sign up for the Launch Longmont Housing Newsletter, which is a milieu of ways to take action and interesting reading material and information about upcoming launch meetings. If you're interested into the, in this sort of thing, you might also be interested in coming to a launch meeting. They are the first and third Mondays of the month at 6.30 p.m. here at Longmont Public Media.